Hi, so hello and welcome to the session. Uh, my name is Gabriel Gomez. I joined SUSE exactly nine months ago, so on the 7th of uh, January, to work on user space live patching. Um, uh, the reporting to Michael Matz, who is also working with me in the development of this tool. Uh, so what is this session about? So we have our agenda. So first I'll start with a brief introduction of user space life patching. I'm going to be brief. I'm, I'm going to try to be brief and to do some comparisons against kernel life patching that you're probably all aware of. Aware of. Then I'll start uh, showing the differences that have the differences in the project since it has last been presented in this conference in 2018 by João Moreira. Uh, so first I'll tell the differences uh, in the consistency checks that uh, libpulp, the library and tool that controls user space life patching has to do before applying a live patch. So this has changed since 2018. And this has changed, but this was changed by Joao, by Joao, not by me. And then we'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, show a live demo of a real world example, and uh, not so real world, but uh, more real than than just uh, test cases. And after that, uh, I'll tell about the problems that uh, I started to notice during uh, my work uh, here at SUSE. And some of them were triggered by the, the real world examples that uh, I was trying to create. So for instance, uh, uh, with multiple libraries, uh, we had some problems and then we had that had to be fixed. I'll explain what happened in this situation. And then I'll show uh, two problems uh, related to a, sy a synchronous signal safety. Uh, one of them was previously known. It, was, it, has, it has been reported by Joel as a known issue in the past. And then another one that popped up uh, while working on demos and testing. Uh, and after that, I'm going to show uh, a little bit uh, of the test cases uh, very, very briefly just to explain uh, that all these changes have been added and hard coded into the test suite so that we don't see regressions uh, in the future. And finally, we're, I'm going to show a little bit about uh, the performance analysis that I did and the performance tuning as well. And finally, I'm going to talk about the, the plans for how to continue this work. And then finally open it for Q&A. Actually, you can interrupt me at any time. You don't have to wait for the questions and answers session. You can just open the camera and I'll happily answer your questions if I can. So onto the next slide. So you are probably well familiarized with uh, kernel life patching. It, it, it has been a SUSE product uh, for a long time. I'm not very familiar with it, to be honest. Uh, I just know that it's useful for life patching the kernel, uh, which avoids uh, the downtime related to rebooting a machine. So user space life patching uh, is similar to that, but not on a machine level, but on a process level. So for instance, if you have a kernel life patching, uh, it could fix the problems with the kernel. But if the problem with is with the one pro with one program with one process, uh, there's nothing that life patching can do to to help. So user space life patching and the pulp uh, bridges this gap. Uh, this is especially useful for some classes of programs. So for instance, if you have database servers that, for instance, uh, index large databases, uh, doing this indexing takes a long time and you don't want to stop the process to lose that indexing and have to do this again after you restart the process. Or even uh, database servers that bring the whole database into memory. This is one of the classes of problems that for which uh, user space life patching is useful. Also, uh, when you have uh, internet servers that uh, for some reason uh, have open connections and if you would uh, stop the process, if you would stop the server, then it would lose the connections. So user space life patching can fix the, the process without having to lose all these connections. Uh, this is some of the classes of programs that for which uh, user space life, life patching have been thought about. Uh, and 
so one there is one uh, observation I should make because the user space life patching is intended as a life patching uh, solution for shared libraries. If you have a problem in the application itself, then currently there is nothing that uh, libpulp can do to to apply a live patch. So it would be the case that you have a program that links against the shared library, and this shared library has a problem or a security vulnerability or some other problem, and you want to patch it, then the the, li uh, the library can be patched, not the not the program. And this is so because. Uh, Similar to, to what is done in kernel life patching, we have to keep track of, we have to keep the program consistency. So uh, we don't want to put the program in an inconsistent state. And to, to assure that, we have to monitor uh, some boundary. I know that in kernel life patching, what is monitored is the user space, kernel space boundary. So I don't know how this works, uh, but I know that uh, this, this boundary is used as a means of synchronization, so to, to determine if, if a live patch can be installed or if it can be put to use. I, I'm not sure how it works, but the, this boundary is, is used in kernel live patching. In user space live patching, we don't have that, but we do have another boundary, uh, which is the application library boundary. So when a program uh, calls into a library function, we say that it is crossing uh, the application library boundary. And so we keep track of these transitions to, to tell if it is a good time or if it's, if it's safe to, to do the, the live patching. And this helps with keeping the consistency of the execution. So uh, regarding consistency checks, I mentioned that uh, João made some changes since the last presentation in, in this conference in 2018. And this is how it worked in the past. So we, to, to, to start, uh, the lib pulp or the tools in, in, in the pulp would hijack the, the whole process. This means that all of the threads uh, in the process would be put into a, a busy loop, doing, any, uh, doing nothing at all. And then uh, lib pulp would go through each of the threads and hijacking each of them and diverting the execution to a checking routine. So the checking routine will tell if, uh, if, if it was safe or not safe to, to apply a left patch at that moment. So at first, uh, the, the first thread, if it's okay, then it puts the first thread into the busy loop again and then goes to the second, diverts the execution and does this for all of the threads. If all of the threads, uh, are safe in, in a safe condition as as determined by by Lip Pulp, then it should be safe to apply a live patch. And the live patching goes as forward. It first loads a new DSO into memory, like you just in GL open. Uh, and this DSO brings in new functions. So the replacement functions for functions that need to be live patched. And apart from that, it also has to patch uh, function prologues. So this means that uh, the, the libraries, they have to be prepared to be life patchable. So these prologues, actually, uh, when you compile a library to, to make it life patchable, the function prolog has several no operation instructions, so several nops, and these uh, instructions can be replaced with something more, well, something more useful during life patching and and this is what happens during the, the live patching application per se. So this is uh, how, it, how it was done before. Then uh, even before João left the company, he made some changes to that based on feedback that he got from, this, from the conference in 2018. I think that's what he told me in the past. But now it is different. Now uh, there is still the uh, process hijacking. But then that early checking of all the threads that used to be done in the past it's not there anymore. So you don't have to go through all of the threads and, and check if all of them are in a safe condition so that live patching can be applied. Instead, this check is not done and it, it is skipped all together and then live patch install uh, application uh, goes, goes on as before. A new DSO is, op uh, is loaded, which brings, you rep brings in 
replacement functions for the functions that need to be uh, live patched. And then there is the patching of the function prologues, just as before. But apart from that, it also updates some universe counters. And I'll go through them in the next slides. So these are the, uh, the, the universe counters that exist. There is one global counter, uh, which is by process. There is only one. And this is updated during uh, the live patching. Apart from the global counter, there are also local counters. And these are per thread and per library. So each of the libraries that has been compiled to be uh, live patchable, it has a thread local variable. And this thread local variable tracks, uh, it is, it is the, the, the local counter per se. And since it's thread local, there is one per library and one per thread. So uh, this, you have to multiply the number of libraries per, uh, by the number of threads to know how many local counters there are. And, and these are not updated during uh, the live patch application. These are updated during the, the regular execution of the program. And as I mentioned previously, uh, there is the, the application library boundary. And whenever uh, a thread uh, goes through, crosses one of these uh, application libra library boundaries, then the, the local counter gets updated. And we'll see how this, how this, uh, sorry, do we have a question? Oh, let's count the universe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so we'll see how this, how this actually is used to, how this is used to select uh, live patched functions or regular functions. So first of all, uh, when there is a, a a live patch application, a new uh, data structures like this are added to the to internal data structures within LivePulp itself. So when the tour route is, it's related to one live patch function. So you have an address here. This is the old address of the function. And then you have an index. This is uh, controlled by LivePulp. And then you have a list of the tours. So we, each of these, the tours we have two here, each of these detours are new functions that are uh, replacing the original function in the process. So they also have a new universe uh, number. They have a new address pointing to the new function, and then they can be active or not. And this is uh, useful in the sense that you can actually disable one of the live patches, and then just by this, when you disable one of the live patches, it simply just marks this as inactive and then it goes to the previous one and to the previous one until it reaches the, the root, which you cannot disable at all. So, and, and this second line here, this would be an, a similar entry to this first line, but then to another function. So this, it will have a different index, a different original address, and its own list of detours. Still, I have not explained how this actually works because we need the local counter update. So uh, as, let me go back a little bit. So we have a uh, universe, universe uh, number here is numbers here in each of the detours. So this is going to be useful for the explanation of, about the local counter update. So as I mentioned, when we cross the, the application library boundary, then we update these local counters. And this can only be done uh, from the library because it uses thread local variables. And because it uses local, uh, because it uses thread local variables, it has to make calls into TLS get address. And this is one of the sources of overhead that we have uh, with user space life patching. But uh, when apart from that, the, the thread local uh, universe counter always gets updated with the global universe counter whenever it crosses a, a, a boundary. So this is what tells us, ULP red here is what tells us if, if, if a, application library boundary is being crossed or not. When it is being crossed, the universe gets up, the local universe gets updated. When it is not, this, this update gets skipped and then old functions uh, are going to be used. So this local thread universe here is what is used to compare against this uh, data structures, uh, this data tours. So if, if there is a match between universe and local counter, then uh, a function, a new function can be called 
So that's uh, that's why you can apply a live patch regardless of uh, the state of the threads. And then each of the threads will try to determine if it can actually use new functions or not on its own. So there is not a global uh, state uh, reading or something like this. OK, and I mentioned about prologues before. So this is what a prologue looks before patching. So this is, fun uh, this is the entry point of the function. It has a bunch of no operations, no operation instructions before it. And this is also a no operation instruction. This one takes two bytes. And so whenever this function is called, this 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 instruction is called and it does it does nothing at all. But except when it is patched, then it is patched to jump backwards to this knob area that we have uh, uh, created for for life for purposes of, of life patching. So this jump backwards sets up uh, a parameter. So RDI here. We first saves the uh, saves the the contents of the register. Then it uh, sets up the the first argument to a function. This is one of those indexes that I mentioned in the detours, and then it calls into this function. This cannot be seen here, but this is calling a universe handling routine, which will compare the the counters, the global counter against local counters. Actually, the local counters against those. Uh, universe uh, counters within the data structures of the detours. Well, this is the, the this was the, the changes. You have a question, Giovanni? Yeah, yes. Um, the question is, uh, so the, the, the user space binary needs to be prepared for live patching. You cannot patch an arbitrary binary. You need to have the new ops in the prolog ready there, right? Indeed, indeed. Uh, but just for libraries, we're not uh, going to patch any of the programs. Uh, we're, so the way we thought about it, we're going to make it available at least for uh, OpenSSL and, and glibc. So we want to make those like libssl, libcrypto, and libc uh, life patchable so that we can apply this stuff. So you writing a, a program, for instance, you wouldn't have to care. OK, so I said I'm going to pause for a live demo. I hope it works. Uh, I see. It. Let me see if I can share the screen. OK, so I don't see you anymore. So please let me know if you, if you don't see me. I'll start uh, and, and say and tell me by voice, because I can see the screen. So this is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to start a Nginx process. Uh, this is a web server. Uh, so be, actually, before, do you have a question? It's actually visible. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, so uh, I'm going to show which uh, libraries this, uh, this program depends on. So this depends on libssl. Lib and why am I showing this? Because I want to show you that, sorry. Ah, OK. Uh, I want to show you that this has been crafted by me to be something else than what is usually uh, delivered by, by OpenSUSE or uh, SLE in the case. So this is this is LibSSL. This is OpenSSL, but one that has been uh, modified by me to be vulnerable to the hard bleeding problem. As well, it is it is been recompiled to be life patchable. So that would answer perhaps help answer Giovanni's question. So that's why I mentioned that this is not a not a really real world example because I made this uh, very old bug. Uh, broken again so that I can make this life patching. But let's move forward with this. So if I, what I have to do, this is, what I have to do uh, here is LD preload libpop. So this is not, uh, this is the tool that does life patching, but since it is not a uh, dependency of any of these binaries, uh, we have to add the LD preload it. So after I start it, uh, there is a PID here, but let me show you that there is more than one NGINX process uh, going on. So there is that one here which is the master process, and then there is a worker process. So I'm going to copy these because I know that uh, this is the, the, the process that actually replies to, to, my, to my HTTPS request. So if I use this nmap script here, SSL Heartbleed, this is upstream nmap script that tries to check if uh, a uh, machine is vulnerable to Heartbleed. So in this, in, in this case, we're checking this, on this very machine here. And very briefly, it tells us that this machine is SSA hard bleed vulnerable, the hard, very serious vulnerability, yada, yada, yada. OK, and it also tells us that this is only the open SSL versions 
up to 1.0.1f are vulnerable. And I had uh, shown previously that this is 1.1.0i, so a lot uh, further than, than this one. But as I mentioned before, I had intentionally made this hard bleeding so that I could fix it. So and how do I fix it? So we have to use the ULP trigger tool. So the first parameter here is the PID of the process that is going to be live patched, and then a live patch per se. This this live patch here patches the functions that are that I made uh, broken, so that it, so that uh, hard bleed can be seen. So when I do this, the live patch is applied, and then I can try to end map again and see if the problem has been solved. It takes longer now because uh, the way the fix works, it's the fix from upstream. It it does not reply to to broken heartbeat uh, requests anymore. So we waited for five seconds because Nmap is waiting for a timeout. So if the process, if the, the the server did not reply, then it is okay. It is safe to assume that it's been that it's not vulnerable to 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 heartbleed. There is a uh, one thing that I want to show. So I told you that there is more than one process here, the master and the worker process, and then let me. Let, let us kill this process here and see what happens. So the master process will spawn a new worker process. So this is a different PID. So if I run any map again, this is going to be vulnerable again. So uh, this shows us that we have to patch all the processes in a system for it to be, to be for, the, for the whole system to be considered live patch. We cannot patch just one of the processes. It's not like the kernel. There's only one kernel uh, at the same time. Right? Yeah, I hope so. Uh, and what we could have done, but this is more like just for, for the fun of it, we could have patched the, the master process. So like this. This is patching the master process. And then we still have uh, the vulnerability because this, this worker process has been spawned before we live patch the master process. But if we, if we, if we kill this one, Then a new one will be spawned by the master process, and this new one should not be vulnerable to hard bleed. I hope so. Yeah, as intended. Now this is the now the the, the whole process has been live patched. But this is just uh, we don't we wouldn't be looking into into numbers like this. We would just patch everything uh, that needs to be patched and and make the system safe. OK, so this is it for the demo. Let me go back to the regular presentation. So can you see? I hope you can see the, the slides again. OK, so while, while working on, the, on that demo, uh, while working on that demo, thanks, Giovanni. While working on that demo, I got a problem. Uh, I faced a problem. So the, the, the examples and, and tests that were available within uh, the pulp itself within the repository only ever patch it one life, sorry, one library at a time. But because Nginx uses both lib libssl and libcrypto, and because I made both of them uh, life patchable, then we are in a situation that we have multiple libraries that are life patchable, and this caused a problem for me. So what happens was not only this, but uh, uh, an option that OpenSSL uses during their build. The OpenSSL builds use the dash B symbolic uh, linker option. And this tells the linker to always prefer uh, definitions of, of variables of objects within the, the object the, that, it is, that it is linking itself. So what happens is we had this definition of the ULP global universe within the Within each of the libraries, this was this is a a, a small uh, object that is linked against a, a library so that it becomes life patchable. So because we had a definition here, then the B symbolic uh, linker option would prefer this definition instead of the global uh, universe. Then we got to a situation where we had more than one global universe, and then that is crazy, right? Uh, it is crazy, but uh, when I first started to fix this, I went on a different approach. I went on a, an approach that I, okay, so the global universes are not uh, a single global universe anymore. Then you have multiple global universes, and I would uh, trick, uh, make, make tricks to access the correct global universe. 
But then Michel Matz told me uh, that was not a good idea. He told me how to do this better. And then what I did instead uh, with his help was to remove this definition here. Then there is no local definition. And that is okay because during symbol re resolution, when the process is, is brought up, uh, the LZ preload that we passed to the to the command line. This brings in libpop, and libpop has the actual definition, the actual uh, global universe that we want. So uh, when the when symbol resolution happens, then it won't find uh, it won't find these definitions here because there is uh, they they are not existent, and then they will find the definition within libpop. But there's a problem if if uh, if the LZ preload had not been done then there is no global universe at all, right? Because libpop has not been loaded and this could break the, the, the algorithm. But then we have added a, these two lines here, this test that tests for RDI. RDI is the, uh, the, the global universe counter. If it is zero, then it is because uh, symbol resolution has not found a global definition of the counter. Then we just skip the update. Otherwise this, this, this load here would cause a segmentation fault because we're, we're trying to read from address zero, but because we're skipping this and using zero instead, and zero is a nice number for us because uh, universe counting starts at zero. So uh, we were lucky this time, we didn't even have to change the, the default for the global universe, uh, the default number for the global universe. And this fixed the problem with uh, patching multiple libraries with the bit symbolic uh, linker option on. And then we move to, to a, synchronous, a synchronous signal safety uh, problem. So I mentioned before that João has uh, marked as a known problem the fact that we use DLopen, DLSIM, and Calloc during live patch application. And why is that a problem? Because live patch application, it, it, it uses B-trace. And so I'm going to say this, that it works from the context of a signal handler. Although I have a, a, a remark before, uh, afterwards, uh, and because it works on the context of a signal handler, uh, AS and safe functions should not be called, and these three are all AS and safe. This this leads to deadlocks during live patch application. It, it wouldn't lead to deadlock all the time, but it would lead sometimes. So one of the things that I did, I created created a a test case that actually tries to always make this deadlock happen. I'm, I'm not sure if it, it actually uh, guarantees that it always deadlocks, but uh, it, it's been deadlocking on me uh, on systems that I haven't fixed. Uh, it has been deadlocking on me all the time since I, I added it to this test case. And also there's another uh, problem. This one was not first seen before, at least I, I had not re read this anywhere that there is a, an AS and safe conversion. I'll explain what this means in the, uh, in the following slides. So as for the deadlocks, this is what a deadlock looks like when it happens. So if you're able to, to GDB into the process that has deadlocked, this is not trivial because uh, the, the user space life fetching per se uses P-trace, then, then it is already P-traced and then you couldn't uh, uh, attach with GDB, GDB, then you have to do some tricks uh, but, but it, it is doable. It's, it's just not just not trivial. So you would see that uh, from here. This 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 is a function. This, this is load metadata is a function from ULP.C, So a function from libpop itself. It makes calls into Calloc, and then if any of the threads or well, if 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 the thread that has been selected to to apply the live page by the signal handler. Uh, was already in a call to Calloc, then this would uh, deadlock. This is uh, typical of, uh, this is what typically happens when you call yes and say functions from signal handlers. Uh, this is another example, but instead of when uh, libpop calls Calloc, this is when libpop calls dlopen. And we can see here that we don't have any calls to Calloc because but it also deadlocks in the same way because DLopen itself, so the, the, the functions in the DLFCN uh, implementation, they have uh, locks themselves. So this is this one is trying, this function is trying to acquire one of those locks and then we deadlock again. So this is uh, what a deadlock looks like. And to fix this, uh, I added some two known 
two non-standard glibc functions, two, two glibc. These two functions here, they're pretty sta straightforward. They actually test if the locks could be taken or not uh, when a, before applying a life patch. So in the DL open case, it will try lock the locks that I mentioned previously. And in the malloc case, it will go through all of the arenas that have uh, memory available for, for allocation. It would go through all of these arenas. Each of these arenas has a lock, and then it uh, reads the state of the lock. As well as it, because there are many arenas, there is a linked linked list of arenas, and this linked list is also protected by a lock. And we also check this lock. So, whenever these two functions tells us that okay, uh, none of the locks are taken, you could go, you can go on, and you won't have any race conditions. I I won't have a dead lock. But the caveat this only works because of the the, the thread hijacking that I mentioned in the beginning. So because I have put all the threads in a busy loop doing nothing at all, then I know that none of them could be uh, still running while we're running the signal handler. And so we can test like this, we can test the locks like this and, do, and not face a race condition. So there is a caveat, but uh, this hijacking is, is, is done anyway. So this works nicely. So when we have these two functions, then the deadlocks are gone. And, and then the next problem that I mentioned regarding AS and save functions is an, an AS and save conversion. What this means is uh, those universe handling routines that I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, uh, they need uh, to read the, the thread local universes. And so to, and to do this, uh, they would call DL, DLC, and this is a, an AS and save function. So this is not really a problem because this is not uh, running from the context of a signal handler usually. But uh, for instance, somebody could create a program that registers a signal handler and register a, a, an AS, AS save function, for instance. I don't know, uh, SHA1, the, the, the lib crypto function to, to calculate hash sums. This function is AS safe. I'm, I'm guessing, I, I hope it is a yes safe. You could uh, add it to a signal handler, but because the universe handling routines uh, make calls to DLC, any call to, to the SHA-1 function would call in, would go through the universe handling routine, which would call the DLC, and then any function that got live patched would be automatically converted into an AS and save function, and that breaks many programs. Well, not many, not, I'm not sure if many, but it would break valid uses of uh, AS safe functions in signal handlers. Uh, so the way to fix this is, is, is instead of calling DLC uh, during, during the universe handling routines, we do this during the live patch application because we have made all those tests to detect if uh, we could uh, call functions. And then we save the address of a Thread local fashion, fetching function that is that is added to all uh, libraries that become live patchable, and this also got got us got rid of the AS and save a safe unsafe. I'm sorry, these words are hard. AS and save conversion. Uh, okay, I'll go briefly through the test case because we already had 33 minutes. So this is what uh, uh, so. All of the, the things that I mentioned previously were things that I detected that were problems and were fixed. And then uh, to avoid regressions in the future, I coded them as, as test cases in the test suite. We didn't have a test suite before. Uh, MakeCheck would, would not do anything. Now MakeCheck runs these tests, and these and this tests try to cover all the things that I mentioned previously and, and some other things as well. Uh, so we are usually adding. Uh, more test cases to the test suites to, to make it more robust. Here you can see that the deadlock uh, test case fails, and this will always fail on systems that don't have those two functions that I mentioned that try, try to uh, grab the locks from, from DLFCN and from malloc. On, on the other hand, on, fun, on, on, I'm sorry, on systems that uh, have those functions, then uh, this, des this deadlock will, will be gone. I'm, I'm happy to have this failing here because uh, people that actually try to run Lipope on, on unpatched systems, then they will, they will get this failure on, the, on their faces and they will, okay, uh, I need to do something about it. Uh, it's li like a, an alert to users. 
Okay. Uh, Apart from that, we also did some performance analysis and performance improvements to the Pope. So before, uh, when I joined the project, there was there were only. I see we have a question, perhaps. Okay, ten minutes. Thank you. I see that we have. Uh, I saw that we had uh, a couple of entry examples, and these examples were used to to measure performance, but they are uh, very small examples. So we wanted to go for uh, something more close to to the real world. And then I found this article here, this on, on nginx.com that tells how to test a Nginx server for performance. It describes many things. Uh, I just uh, used a small part of it to to make some some performance analysis. So first, uh, I ran the the benchmark using the default libssl distributed distributed by SLE, and then I made that the LibSSL life patchable, as I've shown on the as I have shown on the demo, and I measured that again, and we can see the results in the next slide. So uh, in this column here, the second column, uh, this is the results from the from the execution of the benchmark with the default LibSSL library. So there is no ratio here. This is uh, the amount of requests per second. This table is missing some 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 numbers, not numbers, some. Uh, units, but this is in requests per second. And then this uh, third column here is the an execution of the same benchmark, but now with LibSSL uh, became with LibSSL made into a life patchable library. And we see a, a performance uh, impact here, and this is solely due to the library application library boundary tracking. So as I mentioned previously, the call to TLS get address and, and the things that we have to do around it, they are a source of, of overhead. And this is what's the impact that I noticed uh, with this benchmark. And then I, I created a, a, a new version that brought this, uh, this impact down to around 2% from, from 4, to 4 or 5%. Uh, and I'll show what it is, the, what is the, the, the change. So the library entrance tracking is 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 heavy, as I mentioned, uh, and it is heavy because uh, it uses TLS get address. One of the things that makes it heavy is that it uses TLS get address, and TLS get address has two paths. So on its slow path, it would make calls into C functions, and then when you're calling C functions, then all the the parameter passing, caller save, callee save uh, rules of the ABI apply. And this way, we had to save many registers before making a call into TLS get address. So we are, we added another non-standard utility function. This is lipo TLS get address. What it does is when it when it uh, go, when it goes into TLS get address and it and it can use the fast path, yeah, uh, which means that it is not going to make any calls into any C functions. Then it just returns quickly. So we have to save uh, just a little bit of address uh, of registers. You have a question, Giovanni? Yes, regarding Nginx uh, performance testing, if you can recall, uh, what were you measuring? Connection per second, uh, what was the? It was requests per second. I, I added a single connection, single thread, just to measure uh, requests per second. Request per second, thank you. In the proceedings, I, I give a description uh, of the comment I used and why it was there. Okay, thanks for your question. Uh, okay, so uh, getting back here, uh, so with this with this new function here, we don't have to save as much registers because when it uh, we save just a just a couple of registers, and then when we jump to this function, if it goes uh, through the if the fast path is enough, then it returns immediately. If the fast path is not enough, then it needs to call into C functions. Then this function itself uh, saves the registers for for us. So we avoid saving, popping, pushing and popping of of unnecessary pushing and popping of registers, and this uh, is the reason why the the, the performance uh, got uh, a lot better. Uh, so this is what the code looks like after the when you have the TLS get address function. So if you have the function, then all of these pushes here are avoided, and there will be uh, pops. Uh, of these uh, same registers in the bottom, it's not they're not shown here in this slide. There's only these two pushes here, 
and then you call lipo to let's get address instead of to let's get address and this uh, caused a a performance improvement do we have time yeah we still have some time so very recently uh uh, I, I don't know if Michelle has a question, if it does can come back. So very recently we uh, noticed a, a different problem. So when I, I, I said previously that I was going to say that la user space life patching happens from the context of a signal handler, and but it's not exactly like this because uh, in signal handlers, and me, Michelle Matz told me this, I didn't know, uh, the kernel uh, of the kernel, when it uh, delivers control to the to the signal handler, it has already uh, prepared the stack so that the red zone is being subtracted from. So when the signal handler is is running, it can be a C uh, a signal handler returning C it doesn't have to care about red zone because the kernel prepared the execution for it. But because we're not doing in a, this this the, the the usual way, we're doing thread hijacking, right? So we we first we trace and get the registers from the application. Then we modify the return, uh, sorry, the, the instruction pointer. And, and, and then we set, re set the registers. Then we, this is how we hijack a thread. But you see, we ha I have only modified the, the instruction pointer. I had not done, done anything to the stack pointer. So we noticed that uh, the red zone was being touched very recently, like last week, we noticed that the red zone was being touched. So we also have to do what the kernel does when he delivers control to a signal handler, which is uh, subtract uh, RSP by 128 to avoid the red zone. This is not being integrated yet. It's just known, and we know how to fix it. We have uh, some patches to, to fix this. OK, so as future work, uh, we, we went to work on further performance analysis and improvements. So we, we have done some, some benchmarking, but we need to do more and detect more uh, sources of overhead and, and make it better. Also, uh, it, it is in our plans to extend the test suite coverage, as I have shown. Uh, the problems pop up, and then we, we're happy to add them to the test suite. And it would be nice if we could uh, add more tests, like especially uh, tests more close, closer to to real world scenarios, and also we would we want to develop more uh, better tooling for the project. Uh, currently, we have those ULP trigger tool, and there are other tools that, for instance, list all the processes in in a system that can be live patched. But this uh, these tools are still a little bit uh, rough on the around the edges, uh, so they need a little bit of love. Uh, yeah, this is what we plan to do next. And I guess this is it. So I'll open for, for more questions. And thank you for joining the session. Hi, Lieber. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. <laughs> it's 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 been I did it a long time ago, so that's why you see SLE fifteen SP one. I haven't updated it to to SP two. I got distracted by other other things. And thanks for suggesting the the use of the heart bleed problem as a demo. It it, it is nice. As a demo, indeed. Thank you. So, a a tell uh, while a program while a program is being debugged in GDB, it cannot be live patched because we use uh, ptrace, and then ptrace would return with no. Uh, this problem is this this process is already being 
traced so we cannot attach to it and because we cannot attach to it we cannot uh, apply any live patches i hope that answers your question at least i'm not aware of 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 a way to attaching to a process twice that uh, you mentioned same goes for s trace i guess i i don't know actually i if someone knows please jump in i, I don't know how to answer that yes s trace is using p trace as well so the same okay. goes there thank you 